Welcome to Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Questioning a better way, one gracefully disruptive conversation at a time. Welcome to Turmeric and Tequila. I'm so excited to be here. As always, we have a veteran entrepreneur in the house. So this is for all my business owners or trailblazers or anyone looking to do side hustle or their own hustle. This is great intel. So we've got Dean Mercado. He's been in the small business world, entrepreneur, author uh, for a lot of years. He is uh, the Dean Dean Mercado Company, helps growth-minded entrepreneurs optimize and scale their business. And then Dean's short bio is he is the founder and CEO of the Online Marketing Muscle and number one best-selling author of The Mind Stretch, 49 Inspiring Insights for Business Breakthroughs, and is a well-respected small business coach, author, and speaker with expertise in helping small business owners around the globe raise their game and level up their business. Dean, welcome to TNT. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here with you. Now, do you prefer I call you Kristen or KO? Um, Which is easier? Either one. I, I always introduce myself as Kristen, but from athletics and sports, I got different names. Lacrosse, I was Olsen was my last name, and then CrossFit came, and there was other Kristen, so I was KO. So gotcha. pretty much everybody I know calls me KO, so since we're friends now, you can – whatever you're comfortable with, I'm good. Perfect. That sounds great. <laughs> All right. Yes. Well, I'm so glad to be here with you, KO. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm happy to have you. We always love thank our mission driven business humans. So, before we unpack the book and the mission, because we've got lots of entrepreneurs and I've got questions for you, even as a small business owner myself, sure. but I always want to talk about the human behind the mission first. And I think the stars are out there and we are who we are as a young human. So, tell me a little bit about young Dean and how you were as a kiddo. Sure. Now, as a kiddo, I too was an athlete. As a kiddo, I was more in the baseball vein. So, I had fun in there for a while. Got to represent the uh, the U.S. against Japan as a child, as a you know young teen, which was kind of cool. Uh, but I was always an entrepreneur. It just I didn't really recognize it until much later in life. So I started out. I was the kid mowing the lawns, uh, washing every car in town, shoveling all the snow because I'm from the New York area. No longer I'm in South Carolina, but I was from New York. And um, so then I followed the standard programming which is what everybody else expected and wanted of Dean, which was, okay, you got to go to school. You got to get your college degree. Then you're going to go create your, uh, get your job and then you can create your family. So I started following that mold uh, for the first dozen years, you know, coming out of uh, high school. I, so I did go to college, got my degree, got my master's degree, got the great jobs. I was flying all over the planet in corporate America, doing really cool stuff, making a lot of money. And I was freaking miserable. Yeah. And I didn't know it until I was about a decade deep. Then I was like, what am I doing? This is horrible. I'm like, I can't start a family like this, you know? And I mentioned baseball. I, I was the kid who was getting upset with my father because my father would always show up to the games late or he wouldn't be able to make it. And I didn't understand why as a kid. He had five boys. He was trying to feed us. That's yeah. why, you know, but... So before I had kids and started that journey or that leg of my life, I was like, I, I want to raise my kids. I'm not going to have somebody else raise them. If I'm going to have children, I'm raising them. So I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to do that, things have to change in my life. What am I willing to give up and let go of? And what do I want? So I did some soul searching. So, and at the time I had to reach out to, uh, was my fi fiance at the time. I'm like, look, I'm ready to quit my job. You know, it's, it's a six figure job. It's like, it's a big move, you know, very comfortable. I had a house already, which meant I had a mortgage already, you know? So it's like, okay, if ever I'm going to do this, now is the time. Because if I don't do it now, it, once, once I get married and have kids, it's never going to happen. Right. So she was gung ho. She was supportive. Go for it was the, the, you know, the, uh, from the Rocky movie, you know, go for it. It was one of those kind of moments. And it was like, okay, game on now. Here's the problem. It's like you being an athlete, getting on the field, never playing the sport before in a proper way with the proper rules and getting your rear end kicked all over the field. Yeah. That's kind of what happened to me in the beginning. So I made every single mistake I think you could make as an entrepreneur. And it was painful and devastating because I went from making a lot of money to zero mm -hmm. and well, a mortgage. 
Say again? What age was this about? This was about my early 30s okay. at this time. Uh, cause I spent about, you know, my late teens up until about 30 in corporate America. And then I did a little bit of soul searching and I said, okay, let's do it. So first couple of years struggled, suffered a lot of pain in those first few years as an entrepreneur, did that soul searching, started getting clearer and clearer on what I wanted and what I didn't want, you know, and started learning what I needed to learn. Uh, one big lesson folks. I spent a lot of time unlearning a lot of the junk that they filled my brain with in all kinds of schooling. You know, um, that was great. And I believe me, I am completely grateful for it. However, it didn't wire me for what I was meant to become. It wired me for what they wanted me to become or what they thought I was supposed to become. And those two things weren't in sync at that point in my life. So money isn't everything. I was making the money. It wasn't everything. I was miserable. Right. So, so then after looking and looking and going through pain, I said, okay, I got to get some help. I got to add, I'm missing something here. What's going on? So I got some coaching and I remember coaches at the time telling me, uh, and they're not kind of like the coaching you have now. Coaching is everywhere now. Coaching was harder to find back then. Yeah. And it was kind of like, all right, well, you're running three businesses now, Dean, and you're running them all like, and I'm from New York. I'm trying not to curse, but you know, you're running them all like crap basically. And, um, and, and I remember her telling me, Hey, look, here's the deal. I'll let you keep one of them. We're going to take two of them and put them on the shelf. And when we get the one after a year, when we get the one where we want it to be, then I'll let you choose whether or not you want the other two back. You could take one of the other two back at that point. And I'm like, no, I love those businesses. I can't give it up. I'm not, you know, I made every mistake in the book, in the book, but I was, I was kicking and screaming. It's like giving something up was painful. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so I chose the one that I wanted and that was online marketing muscle. That's the one that's still going today. It's 20 years. We just hit our 20 year anniversary, okay. um, which is amazing in the yeah. digital space. Yeah. Um, so I kept that one, we worked it and we're like, we got to the end of the year and it's like, okay, well you could pick that other business back up. If you want to pick one up, which one do you want? What are you crazy? I don't want those things. Well, those were hard. I don't know what I was thinking because yeah. I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't understand what I was putting myself through that. It was unnecessary first and foremost, but you know, we could spin our wheels and spin our wheels and spin our wheels, or we can just get some help and get some, you know, so out of that came, all right, well, if I could just help a, a few entrepreneurs not deal with what I just had to go through for years, I'm like, then that's my calling in life. That's a good calling. I'd be happy with that. And that's yeah. kind of where I went with that. And so I pursued online marketing muscle. I still made a lot of mistakes, but you know what? Those mistakes made me stronger. They made me better. It's like getting up as a baseball player and swinging the bat. If you don't swing the bat, you're never going to hit the ball. You got to swing the bat, right? So I struck out a lot. It just is what it is. But you know what? Eventually I hit the ball and I hit yeah. it well enough uh, to play at a, a pretty good level at, as a young kid, you know? So, so it was a painful journey, you know? So a few years deep into online marketing muscle, many of my clients were saying, okay, you're giving us fish. We love getting fed. Thank you so much. Your agency is great. It's feeding us. Can you just teach us how to fish a little bit for ourselves? So out of that spawned the coaching. And that's where the Dean Mercado company came into it. So I have two companies running right now. One's the agency, which does all the marketing for everybody. And the other one, so this one gives you the fish. This one teaches you how to fish, right? right. So the coach was born and it was like, okay, um, let's try and help those entrepreneurs. And that's what I've been, I've been at for the last 20 years, you know, between those two companies. It's been amazing. What a journey. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I love that it's like consistent breakdown, breakthrough. And that's why I love athletics yeah. at an early age or even theater or chess or whatever it is. Just something where you're out there and you're learning these life skills through an activity, success, failure, camaraderie, you know, timeliness, whatever. Like it just, it serves you your whole life in that lesson to fail 
early is so important and to get back up. I think a lot of our kids nowadays are coddled so much, like any little oh, failure oof. is a big deal, which is a whole um, other podcast. Um, but it's not just about, you know, the money, like you're saying, and the journey it's a mental health is a huge piece. If you're doing everything right and you're miserable, you know, you got to shift. And some people get so far in it. They've got the golden handcuffs. They get stuck in it. They don't have a supportive partner that says leap. You know, it's really, it's, it's a problem. You can't, if you're, you know, a multimillionaire or whatever the goal is and you're unhappy, it's not worth it. So that mental health is such a huge piece in entrepreneurship that I do not think is covered, uh, but really should be. And we're going to get to the tips and stuff, but was there any around the business, was there any mental health tips that you would suggest to entrepreneurs where you were like, listen, I learned to meditate or I, I did yoga or I cut off work at 9 p.m. Anything you did to take care of your mental health in this process? Well, I've always been a mentally strong person. And I think that discipline came from sports as a young child. Um, a lot of things were ingrained and instilled in me from a very young age. And that did carry me. I got a lot of great coaching through sports when I was younger and people who became like father figures to me. And that was really important to me as a young child, um, especially because the way things were back when I was growing up in the seventies and the eighties, and I'm dating myself a little bit, but, uh, things were a bit different back then. Kids were out in the street playing. Kids were gone all day. Parents yeah. didn't absolutely know where you were all day. So, so there was a lot of mental toughness there already. But, uh, but yes, I did try almost everything that everybody's, I've done the yoga, I've done the meditating. A lot of it is, is about carving out that quiet time. It's about giving yourself a chance to think. Everything is coming at us so fast right now. It's an insane speed where things are going on right now. And you have to take the time to step back and say, time out. Give me a breath. Give me a breath here. You know, let me breathe for a minute. Let me think a little bit. So for years, I've been morning. I have my morning routines. You know, a lot of people have those. I have my morning routines. And a lot of that is just being in quiet, wherever that may be. You know, whether it's sitting outside, you know, in nature, getting a little quiet outside as the weather gets warmer, or even if it's just sitting on the couch in the dark when no one's up yet. I try and do it before the kids get up because once kids get up, it's over. Game <laughs> over, you know? So you, you find your pockets. Yeah. And there is no one size fits all. And that's what I think everybody needs to understand. Everyone's going to say, you need to do this or you need to do that. You, no, you need to find out what works for you. Totally. Whatever, that, whatever brings you that mental sanity, because being an entrepreneur is chaotic. It's oh, yeah. crazy. When it's never know? done. It's, it's like I can't take time off because your to-do list right. is never. It's never completed. That's right. And it never will be. Right. And that's right. the hard thing for a lot of us to understand. And that was, for me, coming out of corporate America, that was a big shift I had to make because you could go home at the end of the day. You didn't have to do work when you went home most of the time. You know, you can shut off at the end of the day. As an entrepreneur, you can't necessarily do that. When you own the business, buck stops with you, you right. know, and that's just the way it goes. But yeah, you've got to find whatever it is that works for you. Sports is a great, great outlet. Exercising is a great outlet. That's part of my morning routine, you know, where I get up and I do my thing. Got to move your body, yeah. you know? Um, so you find whatever makes your, whatever clears your energy, yeah. right? So that you're not all backed up energy-wise, right. energetically. You got to get in touch with yourself and find out, like you said, what works for you. Just like nutrition and fitness, find whatever it is and then lean into it. Um, yes. Well said. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, so, it's, you, like you said, everyone's selling something all the time. So they're telling you this one size thing, but the best intel is you can lean into you and like what really brings you joy and just do whatever amount of it you can. That's fitness right. is my angle for that. Um, so I've been an entrepreneur for over 25 years and like you, it was a bumpy ride and, you know, then internet took off and Instagram and social media, and there's been so many extraordinary changes. You know, we've got political impact and the economic impact. Like there's constantly things as entrepreneurs, as all people, you know, that we face, um, but it's difficult. And the online situation, I consider myself pretty privy to social media and the internet and the whole game there. However, SEO has always been a challenge for me. That is not my brain. Uh, I would love for you to lean into, well, number one, tell us specifically what Online Marketing Muscle does. And then if you can have any tips for like a, our smaller businesses, we have tons of startups that listen, but if you're a smaller business with little to no budget, what is like the most important thing you would suggest around um, SEO or online marketing in general? Wow. I mean, that's a heavy question. And yeah. it's, it's, you know, I'll try and answer as best as I can. 
I've been coaching a lot. So I've, I've worked, I've coached probably somewhere between 10 and 20,000 hours of working directly with very smart entrepreneurs from around the world. So I got only not my perspective, but what I see happening in other businesses. Now, in terms of what online marketing muscle does, that's changed a lot over the years. One thing in this, in this space, if you don't keep moving, yeah. you become obsolete very quickly. And, you know, in the beginning, I was trying to convince people why they needed to have a website. Companies didn't even have websites yet when we started. So uh, that was a brand new thing. A lot uh, when we talk SEO, the more the things change, the more they stay the same. And one thing I could tell you is a lot of the things that worked 10 years ago still work now. Most people just do it badly. They don't they don't do it well enough or they hire SEO people who really don't know what they're talking about. When I coach my clients, a lot of times I'm teaching them SEO and I tell them, hey, if you ever want to quit what you're doing or sell your business and come work for me, you know, and, and do SEO for my clients, you know, because they end up learning it better than the SEO companies do it out there. I believe it. The, the key is, is you got to know yourself first and you got to know your audience. Who is your audience exactly? What's important to them? What kind of questions are they asking? When they search for things, what are they looking for? You know, um, very simply, you got to have a great website. I don't care. You got to have a great website, not a, not a decent website. You got to have a great website. You know, um, the great website will at least attract the beast, Google, um, in a way that you want them to see you a certain way. Uh, that's very important. It just is. You know, I'd like to say it wasn't, but it just is. And it is also from the standpoint of when people do find you, you know, perception is reality. How they perceive what they're seeing is how they're going to judge you, how they're going to gauge, how they're going to decide in those first few, first few seconds whether or not they're going to hire you or call you or think about even working with you at all. So when it comes to SEO, you have different kinds of SEO. There's the on-page SEO stuff that you're going to do on your website. That's the, the meta descriptions, the meta SEO tags, you know, things like that. Uh, when we try and rank for specific phrases – we go after topical content more so than a specific word because the algorithms in the search engines are so complex these days. If you're, if you have a website that has to do with, let's say you're a fitness trainer and you have a website and you're promoting yourself for your, your training service, right? Great. Fantastic. Well, you've got to know exactly what your clients or your potential clients would be looking for. And then you create content on that site based on that, right? So if you're, if you have a specialty in, let's say, uh, leg workouts, that's your thing. You're known as the leg person. You, you do the best work with your clients on getting them amazing legs, strong legs. Everything else seems to fall into place somehow. I don't know. Strong legs on these. So anyway, so you make sure that you're creating content around that so that you become known as that person. So your brand overall is going to become very big when it comes to SEO. I learned 15 years ago doing SEO how important your brand is to how well you show up in the search engines. If Google sees your brand is strong, then your, your stuff is going to show up at the top of the search rankings most of the time. If your brand is weak, then it's not. And it's really that simple. Now, Kristen or KO, in your case, you could be found all over the internet right now because you're doing stuff everywhere. So yeah. your brand is getting stronger and stronger by the minute. The st more stronger your brand shows uh, shows up out on the internet, you could put out a piece of garbage blog post on your website and that garbage blog post will rank better than even the best people who have a, who have a worse brand. So paying attention to how your brand is showing up across the internet is critically important, right? And then you'll find you start to pair that with quality content, helpful content, which is one of what the more recent algorithms of Google was actually called, the helpful content algorithm. There's so much garbage on the internet. You have to find a way to break through and get your stuff seen, right? Don't be the best kept secret anymore. It ain't going to cut it. You've right. got to find a way to create topical content, pick a topic, own that topic, cover that topic from every angle, right? So when Google thinks about, hey, somebody wants to learn how to, to uh, strengthen their legs. Okay, great. Well, this fitness expert over here has 15 articles on their blog talking about it from every angle, right? They've got the topic well covered, 
right? So chances are they might rank a little bit higher. So it is a game, you know, and it's like anything else. There's things you have to give up or let go of, and there's things you have to embrace and really work forward and go move forward with. Um, if you want to get physically fit, are you going to get physically fit by eating ice cream every single night? Probably not. You know, those workouts you're doing during the day are probably going to not do so well for you if you're adding that many calories late in the day, every single day, right? right. So same goes with SEO. We've got to look at the content that we're putting out there. And we've got to say, are we putting junk out there? Or are we putting stuff that actually matters? Stuff that's helping people, answering questions they have, addressing angles that, that maybe no one else is addressing. In a sense, it's going to get harder. And I don't mean to make you feel panicky or dissuade you in any way. If I were approaching it from scratch, I would certainly look at building my brand. Yeah. Definitely. I would look at building my brand. I would look at creating tactical content that support and lift up, boost up and prop up that brand around something specific that I want to be known for. If you're going to try and be known, if you're, let's, I'm just going to keep using the fitness expert because we're building on it. Sure. If you're a fitness expert and, and you want to be found, right? If you're covering on your blog, everything possible about fitness, chances are you're not going to rank well. And I hate to say it that way. And you may be very knowledgeable in numerous angles at fitness. And that's great. However, you know, if if you're trying to come at it from too many angles at once and you're you're kind of doing a little bit in every little area, you become an expert at none of those areas. Right. What do you want to be known for is the big question. I'll usually stop people in their tracks as a timeout before you create another piece of content. What do you want to be known for? Right. What are people who are you looking to serve? What are they looking for when it comes to what you offer? Could you be the one who's known for that particular thing? You know, whatever that is. So, you know, um, if if uh, if you have a specialty in legs or maybe it's midsection work, whatever it is, try and come at something specific. Or maybe you angle it more towards fitness for over 50s. Right. You know, that's a, that's a niche. You got to yeah. carve it down somewhere. It's not, well, I serve anybody who wants to get fit. Okay, well, that's great. Well, you know what? You're probably not going to rank right. for most everything. You know, and you're probably, the generalists don't rank very right. well. The specialists yeah. do. The discoverability always tends to be a, a really, you know, hard thing to approach as an entrepreneur, as a podcaster, as any sort of really anything at this point, TikTok or whatever it might be. Uh, and the flip side of that is not only is there a bunch of crap out there and it's hard to get recognized, the consumer is so much more savvy. So if you're not positioning content of value that's in the right niche, you're going to be missing out. So you really got to show up with your A game. It's kind of like being an athlete. Like if you're not doing the training on the weekends and showing up 100% come tryouts, like you're just not going to make it. So you really got to sharpen the edges. The good thing is I'm glad to see the consumer just get so much more conscious and so much more dialed in, especially our young people. They've been doing this, you know, digital dance forever. They know how to weed through the, the crap and the traffic that isn't real. So it holds us as entrepreneurs account accountable for what we're putting out there, which I think is a good thing. And it makes those of us that are serious about this in it. I do like how you, you know, when you were younger, when you're kind of searching and you're starting out, you sought out coaching. I think that's one of the best things anyone can yes. do. As an early entrepreneur out of college, I certainly didn't have coaching, but I had mentors and coming off, you know, as an athlete, I was very used to that relationship. So it was easy for me to ask for help and then enter into a, a situation where I was receiving help. I think that's still hard for a lot of people. It is. Uh, but, you know, even when you're talking about your business, what would you suggest? Like if a company's failing, they can't figure it out. I've certainly done the dance where I want to do something a certain way because I love it, but that might not be what the market wants. Out of the gate, I suggest entrepreneurs really get a coach or work with a company like yours right away. What do you think they, like a company just started out, should budget to work with someone like you if they don't know SEO, if they don't want to do it, and they just rather outsource it from the get-go? I mean, that's a really tough one. It depends on the type of business, number one. It depends on uh, what their expectation is, how much do they want to grow, and how fast. Speed is a currency, and yeah. speed costs. So the faster you want something to happen, the more you should expect to spend. You know, um, most people I could tell you don't spend nearly enough investing in themselves and investing in their business. When I say investing in your business, that means marketing. That means sales, right? Investing in the pieces, building systems, 
systemizing and systematizing that business. You know, we do that a lot with our clients that a lot of clients are, they say they want this out here, but they're not really doing things that are going to get them there. It's like me saying, yeah, you know what? You know, I want to build six pack abs, right? Now, if you're a trainer and you look at me, you say, okay, well, I get that you're doing that. Let's take a look at what your current situation is. Let's look at what your routines are, what your diet is, what your, you know, everything. They're going to look at everything. Same thing we do with a business. We'll look and we'll, we'll come in and we'll look and we'll say, okay, what's really going on here? Is what you're saying realistic? And this is the hardest part about being a coach is when you have to tell somebody, hey, the way you're playing the game right now, this likely is not going to happen. Right. So unless you're willing to give something up, you know, we might as well refocus what you're thinking of, thinking about. And that's not meant to be harsh, but this comes from a lot of years of pain and it comes from my core values. And I saw your, your episode on core values. I loved it, by the way. Thank you. My Thank personal you. core values to love, create, and learn. Love, create, and learn. So everything I do is about spreading love. That's what I do. So when I give of myself, that's me giving love, sharing love, right? So sometimes it's tough love. Yeah. And I tell people things that I wish somebody would have told me. Exactly. You might have saved me a lot of time and a lot of anguish. Yes. You know, instead of wasting time doing things. So if I'm a new business and I'm starting up, you know, it really is about a lot of the programming we got is incorrect, yeah. right? If you Perfect. really want to, if you Old really school. want to own something, you want to be known for something, pick a target market first, then figure out what their pain is. What are they willing to pay for? What are they willing to separate? with their hard-earned money for, and then figure out if you can give that to them. You know, as opposed to, oh, I, I could build websites. Okay, great. Does anybody, do we need another web designer on the planet? Probably not. Most web designers are garbage. Can somebody make a lot of money doing it? Yes, you can. Yeah. But it takes, it's a lot harder now because there are millions of companies doing it. Right, right. So you've got to fight that fight. You know, which means the stronger your brand gets, the more you have a chance of winning in that game. But again, it's about you when you look at yourself and you say, okay, what do I really want? How much money do I really need to earn? What would be a comfortable lifestyle for me? You know, and it's the kind of soul searching I had to do early on and say, you know, did I need a billion dollar company? No, I didn't. I re recognized that early on when I first came out of corporate America, I was programmed. Oh, it's got to be bigger. Bigger is always better. No, it's not. Right, right. Bigger can mean miserable. Uh, totally. Well, you lose control totally. of what's going on. Is that what you want? So if you've got to look at what you're comfortable with, what you're, if you're looking to make 250,000 a year, which will get you a pretty decent living in almost any state in the, in the country. Great. You know, you could have a pretty good living with 250 barring California and New York, where it would right. be still be a little tight. You know, remember I came from New York. Uh, sure. So but anyway, it starts out with really doing that. What do I want? Who do I want to do it for? You know, um, how can I help them? What are they asking for? So right. a lot of the things we think somebody wants, is not really what they want. And even if they say they want it, the problem is, are they willing to separate with their own hard-earned cash to have it? Right. That's the big challenge right there. Right. So a lot of us will say, I want to get fit. I'm going to be in the best shape of my of my life, right? But the bottom line is, if I could have done that already, if I, I would have done it already, if I could have done it, I would have done it already. Right. Right. So yeah, I probably should hire a trainer. Am I willing to separate with the money to pay a trainer, a proper trainer for me who knows uh, the type of workout a 56 year old man should have who lives a certain lifestyle, you know, they have to understand my situation. So when you, the more you understand your niche, the better you're going to be. Yeah. And the Googles of the world will recognize that when they see you speaking a certain way, when they see you getting a certain amount of attention, you know, I have certain niches that I own. I yeah. speak at all their big events, right? I'm on all their podcasts, right? I get in front of them any opportunity I can. I spend time with them. I coach them, right? We build all their websites with my other, other company. We do all their SEO with my other company. So the more intimate you can get, with your ideal target, the easier this process gets. 
I love that. You know, well, and, and like you said, it's it's so much about knowing yourself. Because I think if once you get in this, it's fun, it's fiery. But then if it doesn't really speak to your core values long term, you're just going to be like back in that corporate situation where you've got internal discourse and you feel that miserable feeling. Like you've got to really unpack the human side of everything before the millions or the billions or the hundred thousands, whatever. You got to know you. And I don't. And our school system does not really teach no. us to be individuals. You know, we're taught our education is based off, you know, assembly lines and corporate world structure way, way back in the day. So it's kind of do the best you can with the most general um, situation and that, that fits most and it fits for you. <laughs> so you got to do your own personal responsibility. I think that's the upside of social media. And this is a perfect segue to my next question. Uh, our, our young people can see different examples. There's extra access to representation and different people doing different things through social media. Of course, there's a ton of crap on there as well and misleading things. However, you can see so much more, you know, in the palm of your hand with your phone and see different avenues, different routes. Kids don't have to go to college, go get a trade or do whatever it is like, but get to know yourself earlier. And these conversations can start so much sooner. I am curious, you know, because you lean so heavy on websites, I as entrepreneur um, over the years and still really do position, you know, do I put an energy towards social media? Do I put an energy towards my website and social media for me recently, I'd say even the past 10 years has consistently won out. And uh, as different projects have grown and we're allocating different resources to different things, I, I have seen websites kind of kick back up. So we're going to lean back into that. But social media, man, it's been a jungle to keep up with. And I actually do enjoy it. Um, I've done influencers forever and we, my business has done that forever. So we've seen that grow and evolve. And I've worked on the narrative around it because there is so much garbage. But my question for you is, you know, having the social media and website, like what's your thoughts on it? And how do you feel about social media versus a, a website? Like where, where do you, in your opinion, think we should put the priority? Right. I mean, well, it's not an either or. Let's put it that right. way first. It's definitely not. Um, the bottom line is it depends on which and where your, your target market's going to resonate with you. Right. So if and it depends on you as the person. Like, for example, in your case, KO, obviously you're very comfortable in that space. You can get out there and you don't mind throwing it all out there and laying it out. Not everybody likes that. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody's comfortable there. So when I'm coaching clients, I'm looking for where their strengths are. It would be like what we would call a SWOT analysis. We would be running a SWOT analysis on you to say, where are your strengths? Where are your weaknesses? Where are your opportunities? Where are your threats? And that's going to help us dictate what your overall marketing machine should look like. You know, so we put together an individual recipe for our clients in that way where we're saying, okay, you need this, you need this going on here and this going on on this social channel and this over here. But it is a combination of all of them. Yeah. Right. So if you're if your audience is on Instagram, you better be on Instagram. That should be where where you're putting your uh, your energy, right? But I always use my website as home base. That's ultimately I got to get them off social media and I got to get them into my home, because as long as they stay there, I don't own them. I can't right. I can't do what I want to do. But once I get them off there. And I start training them to do what I say and come where I'm asking you to come, do the things I'm asking. That's how we start transitioning them from just looky lose to somebody who's actually willing to pay you yeah. for what you do. So it gets a little challenging, but it is, and it is an individual thing, folks. I hate to say it that way. You've got to look at what, what works for you and your target market. You know, for me, much like you, KO. I love being out in the spotlight. I'll go on any stage you put me on, you know, any, any entrepreneur that I can help with just one idea. And that's what I say. If you walk away from today with one idea that you can act on, then we did our job here today. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's better off. So, so I do love social media. I'm an early adopter. I'm not a big fan of certain channels as much as I used to be because I don't like their policies and their practices on how they do things. And I don't like, how somehow they found their way to have their way and their and instill their will on our data and our information and and things like that. So, um, and I'm and I play in this space hard. So it's been a hard fight for me over the last couple of years, in particular, with certain channels. I, I tend to spend more time now on specific channels, even though I know I could be better served with my clients on other channels that I really don't want to be on. But mm -hmm. I've built enough brand equity that I can compensate for that. Not everybody can. Right, you know? right. So I can handle that hit that I'm taking by not being on that channel. 
Yeah. You know? Well, I actually, not to interrupt you, I actually think that's really critical for you staying true to your own brand because the consumer is so savvy and we are so out there. I think if you stand in your truth and you take a stand against something that doesn't fit for you, I actually think that deeply serves your brand. So sure, you're losing views hypothetically in that space, but for all of your true fans that watch and follow you, I think they'll respect you more and lean in even more because you took that stand. And that's, that doesn't happen a lot in this day and age. I mean, I'm a huge Madonna fan and one of the, she, I like her music and everything, but I was an early fan because she was such a disruptor and she turned down Pepsi early on when they wanted to do this commercial and she wanted to do it a certain way and it, it impacted her creativity. And she said, no, thanks. And not a lot of artists will walk away from a $5 million check, a mainstream commercial, right. you know, at, at the beginning of their career, this wasn't right, the height. Right. So, you know, so it, I think it serves, um, I always tell my influencers and, and as a coach as well, it serves sometimes to take the hard stand, even if it's a, a, a short monetary loss or viewership loss or whatever. I think there's such massive gain that isn't measurable that happens and it builds, create, um, you know, no like, and trust is strengthened and all these, you know, original things when people sign up. I think your, your, your valid fans stand even truer when Agreed. you take your authentic stand. That's so well said. So well said because- these last several years, um, I know for me, I stood very strong in my values. Good. Very strong. And that's part of also what I attribute to why online marketing muscles still around after 20 years. You know, you can't be so attached to something that you're unwilling to let it go if it doesn't serve you. Right. And there's no way I could wake up in the morning and be comfortable with who I was if I was still playing on certain channels in the way I was and throwing so much money at those channels, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so at some point you have to figure out what that looks like for you, you know, and be willing to take a hit if necessary. And I did, you know, but yeah. my brand, again, I spent 20 years building it as an entrepreneur with online marketing muscle. I had a lot of street cred. So at the end of the day, I could handle the hit. Not everybody's going to be able to, but you know what? There's always another channel you can play on. There's always another, another ball field you could jump on and go play, another court you can get on and do your thing. Look around. Yeah. Don't be stuck on, oh, it has to be this or it has to be that because so-and-so is doing this and so-and-so, no. no. Just because it's right for them doesn't mean it will be for you. Totally. Well, it's going to go back to that mental health. If you're feeling uncomfortable, you're supporting a cause that you don't believe in. And again, this is where I think our young people are, are, are conscious consumers and they're going to vote with their dollar and say, no, thank you just on principle alone. So if you don't, if you, you say that you're staying in these arenas that you don't authentically want to be in at some point, that internal friction is going to continue and it's setting you off course. It's taking the opportunity cost to go be where you're supposed to be, be amongst your crew or where you have impact or where you're most useful uh, just because you think you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. There's, like, there's just no need for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean. I do think all the channels are recording all of our data, though. I think we're way. We're they way are. Better. They are. And, you know, it's unfortunate in a way. It just is what it is. And it's, you know, we could fight and fight and fight and fight. And it's a no-win battle in this case in because of the way that the game is set up at this point. There are certain rules to the game, and we have to learn how to navigate those rules. You know, part of what I do is is help people understand what those rules are so that yeah. they, they learn how to navigate this game a little bit better. So what I can tell you is one of our, um, and I'm just going to jump back a little bit to the marketing side for a second. One of our methodologies is called your unique marketing recipe. And that is a formula that we use and we apply it to people and helps them figure out what their recipe is, you know, so in your case, KO, you have a specific recipe that you use. You found things that work for you. Timber yeah. Game. You know, that's your branding. You're, you're running it hard. I see it. I, I, I jumped up on, on a couple of social media channels. I could see you playing the game. And yeah, yeah you're moving down the right path, right? You're doing a lot of right things, okay. you know? So with any of you who are just starting out, and you asked a question earlier where you're like, okay, well, how much should I invest in this? How much... If you're not making the sales that you want to be making, then you should be investing almost everything that comes in. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'd say I'd give you a number like 80% of what you got coming in should be back into investing into building the brand, building the building the uh, content, building building yourself up a little bit so that it becomes easier to make those sales going forward. You know, um, if you don't see that as possible because you're eating, you want to eat. You know, believe me, I understand that. I was there too. 
But at some point, something has to give. What are you willing to give up? Should you be doing this entrepreneur thing yet? Or should you be holding down a job until you get this thing to a certain point? Right. You know, I jumped in cold turkey. Same. You know, a lot of that was my ego, yeah. right? My ego got very much in the way in the beginning. Would I have done it the same way? No, I wouldn't same. have. I would have done it very differently, you know, but a lot you of times we allow things to get in the way of what really needs to be happening. So yeah. you've got to look at any money you spend, if you do it wisely, as an investment in you and an investment in the brand that you're building. That brand is meant to serve somebody. You do have an audience out there. I don't care what you sell. Right. There is, you have a unique audience that's meant to buy from you. Your job is to put yourself in front of them. Right. So if you don't know who your target audience is, first off, that's, you got to stop what you're doing and say, hold on a second. Who is my ideal target? And I'm not saying the whole dartboard that you're just throwing darts and you don't care which number you hit on the dartboard, right? If you say that my target is that bullseye, the red dot right in the middle of the board, then that's what you're aiming for. And right. then if you hit just outside of that, it's not so bad, you know? Right. So again, you've got to really hone in on who you're going after and why. And with what, you know, yeah. and not be afraid to let go of what's not working. Qu if question for my podcasters specifically. And um, we actually just closed our first title sponsor. So that's huge for us in the space. Congratulations. Thank you very much. We're very grateful. Four years in the game. And I've been very strategic about not monetizing it early and just getting the reps in and, and doing things the right way, building the base. But for my podcasters out there that do want to monetize and lean in. Um, almost no podcasters are making money. They say there are some for sure out there. And then there's, you know, the ones on the, the way tip top that are making millions and, and have, you know, uh, exclusive deals. Would you think it's worthwhile for like podcasters specifically to spend for SEO and build the brand awareness, even when they're not selling something yet? I think with any business and podcasting is a business. I think with any business, you have to invest in that business. If you don't, what's it going to do for you? Yeah. You know, you, you remain the best kept secret. Again, the, the podcasters that already have a brand always find it easier to get it off the ground. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a brand and you're starting to build the brand as you build the podcast, it's going to take a lot of reps, Right. you know, it might take you two years before right. you start really seeing something happening. It could take you longer than that. It depends on you and it depends on your message. Every podcast, and this is a mistake I see a lot of podcasts make is they're too all over the place in yeah. what they cover and and too all over the place in the audience that they mean to serve. So the more niche you are, the better it's going to be for you. Don't be afraid to niche down on something specific, right? So it's like that fitness example I was using earlier. You could do fitness for everybody or you could do fitness for over 50s or 50s for, uh, you know, fitness for, for, uh, for teens, you know, right. you'll find more money in those pockets that are underserved, right? Who are you going to go to when you have, uh, I feel palpitations in my heart. Who am I going to go to my generalist doctor, or am I going to go see a heart specialist Right. who could right. tell me what's going on? Yeah. This is the same thing that goes on with podcasts right now. There's not a ton of podcasts, but there's a ton of podcasts, right? Well, there's a lot of glut actually in it. Yeah. So Committed. this is what we're fighting with. It's not that your audience that's meant to hear your podcast doesn't want to hear your podcast. They can't find you. Right. There's so much other crap in their way. They can't see. So you've got to work toward investing in, okay, what's the, what's the minimal viable product that you need to put forward to make money? And you've got to look at it that way and say, what's that minimal viable product? Okay, well, I need a good website, right? Does that mean a $50,000 website? No, no way. Not right now, you know? Um, does, it mean, does it mean you need to be on every social channel, pumping stuff out every single day, five times? No, pick a channel. Pick a channel. Own that channel, right? And then, yeah, there's a thing called technology where you can push things to other channels. But you know what? A lot of people who are Instagram people, they know when something's not created for Instagram. It totally. doesn't it doesn't fit. It doesn't feel right. So in a sense, you're damaging your brand. You know, so unless you retrofit it, 
so that it does fit the way Instagram uh, people who are on Instagram like to receive their data, or like to see what they want to see. So whatever channel, pick a channel, go hard at it. You know, where you do post your podcast, if we're talking podcasts, that matters a lot where you do post. Where does your target market hang out, right? If you don't have a huge audience already, you've got to get, you've got to do what we call in the, your unique marketing recipe. I mentioned that uh, methodology earlier. Part of that is understanding that there's three purposes of marketing. One is to expand your, your visibility with the people who already know of you. You got to stay visible, top of mind. Then there's your credibility, right? You've got to when they do see you, you've got to show up as a credible brand. And then there's reach. Reach is about getting in front of people who are in your target audience that don't know you yet, that, that you want to get to know. So when you focus your marketing on one of those three things, or if you're lucky enough, you can do marketing that fits all three, right? And in your unique marketing recipe, we help our clients do that. They could pick the couple of things instead of doing 40 things, which all cost money, and right. time is money, folks. Don't kid yourself, totally. right? It's picking the three things. If you could only do three things to market yourself, what would they be and why? Are they getting you reach? Are they, are they increasing your visibility? Are they increasing your credibility? Which one are they doing? If they're not doing any of those, stop. Yeah. Stop wasting time. Stop wasting money. So with a lot of podcasters out there, they think that they record a podcast and they throw it up on iTunes and that's it. Right. And they walk away. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. You're going to get what you deserve, which yeah. is probably not much, you know, or you do it and people aren't seeing that brand somewhere. Like with turmeric and tequila, I'm seeing the shirts. I'm seeing the hats. <laughs> I'm seeing the social media site. You know, yeah. when, when my guy first reached out to you, he was checking you out all over the place. Hey. That's his job is okay. to find me the people who matter. Yeah. I, and I don't mean that to sound horrible. It's not. It's, yeah. you know, I'm trying to spread my reach as well. I'm trying to help as many entrepreneurs. We're on a mission right now this year to get in front of a million entrepreneurs, a million sets of eyes. And that's not because I want much more sales. I'm happy where my sales are. That's because we're trying to, we saw what happened with all the junk over the last few years. And we've been hell bent on a mission to try and help as many as we can to get them back on their feet. And that's why we're doing a lot of podcasts right now. Yeah. We're getting yeah. out there and just whatever somebody wants to know, I'm giving it away. Yeah. What do you want to know? You know, if I can help you, I'll help you. If I can't, I'll tell you that too. Yeah. You know, I love but, that. But you know, figure yeah. out what it is you want and go after it. I love that. I love, I love the uh, intentionality. It all kind of bail, ba bases back to that whole human approach, getting to know yourself, getting to know what your goals are, your intentions, and really what impact you want. I think everybody gets a little weary about giving back or philanthropy or what have you. But if you're not showing up in some act of service and giving back however you can, at the end of the day, it's not going to equate to much. I don't care what you believe in, religion, right. politics, whatever. It kind of boils down to like how useful you are in this world. And that's what coincides with your mental health. And if you can get the mental health right, the physical will be okay. The budget will be okay. The relationships will be okay. Um, it all flies in line. So I love that your journey really highlights that getting back to this customized approach, not only in business, but your approach to yourself and getting to know who you are as a human. So how you're ultimately going to yes. be happy who you are this most useful being in this world. Um, yes. We can go on. I really love how your core values led, but before we cut off, I definitely, I've got one final question for you that sure. I ask everybody. And I, I kind of know, I, I have a feeling how you'll answer it, but what is success to you? Well, I remember when I was uh, when I was younger, when I first got turned on to uh, self help type programs. One of my one of my early when I was about eighteen, I got turned on to one called Lead the Field, and that was from a guy named Earl Nightingale. Um, so he was an early mentor to me, even though not not in person, but through his programs, through his books, and he defined it as you know um, where where opportunity meets preparedness, you know, that's where my success lies in that area. So, um, success is whatever you want it to be. It's whatever you want in your life. And it's critical that you really do understand yourself and what's important. Me, when I was stepping into entrepreneurship, it was important for me to be able to create something that gave me the freedom to be able to operate a business from anywhere on the planet. 
with an internet connection. That was my goal. I have achieved that. I just moved my business from New York to South Carolina without a hitch, right? So success to me was about gaining the freedom to be able to do what I wanted to do, when I wanted to do it, how I wanted to do it in my way, right? So you've got to figure out what that looks like for you. And that's why doing that inner work is so mission critical. In the early days, I got caught up too, like most people do in terms of what other people think we're supposed to do and what other people define success as. Or we see somebody who's crushing it out there and we think that, oh, I got to do that. That's the only way I can reach it. No, it's not the only way to, to success. Success is however you define it. One of the best parts about being in my 50s now is I don't give a crap what anyone thinks about me anymore. Yeah. That part is gone. I don't care about that anymore. And once I released that and I allowed myself to be who I needed to be, boy, did life change. Yeah. Life became so much better and it became easier because I wasn't worried about what they think, you know, and that I'm not meeting their expectation of who I am and how I'm showing up, you know? So when you could look in the mirror and you're happy with what you see, my friends, you've seen success. That's what it is. Does that there make sense? You go. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Dean, where do we find you? I've been on the internet a long time. I am everywhere, much like KO here. If you Google Dean Mercado, you will see me everywhere. Um, DeanMercado.com if you want to learn about our coaching stuff and you want to find out what's going on in here. Uh, our Mind Stretched, our book is up there, all that stuff. You want the help in the marketing side, online marketing muscle. We got our clone owner methodologies, our your unique marketing recipe methodologies, a lot of good stuff there too. Um, on social, the ones I'm playing hard on right now is LinkedIn is where I am mostly right now. Okay. Most of the other ones I'm not playing as hard um, at this point in time for whatever those reasons are. Um, you'll find me on videos all over, all over YouTube as well. So uh, right. hopefully that helps. I do give a lot of weight, a lot of free stuff on my sites. Grab them. You know, I'm not a hard salesperson, so I'm not going to chase you down and look to, you know, uh, ask you for your firstborn and all of that stuff. That's, you know. Not how I play the game. If, if ever people, we're meant to work together, we will. People, will be, I think some people I know would be glad to give away their firstborn before somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate you. I love the East Coast energy. I'm a, I'm definitely a Colorado kid, but I've always had an affinity for New York. I don't know what it is. So right. but he's lacrosse. So all my friends are like Northeastern humans. Um, Excellent. So I love it. And I, I saw that you were a big uh, New York sports fan. But dude, South Carolina, did you watch the basketball women's tournament? You no, know, I just saw the replay of the game. And yes, I love please. it. See, being from New York, yes. we don't know college sports from New York. <laughs> Because we have all professional sports teams. Yeah. So we pay no mind to college. And then I came down here and I watched the video and I was like, oh my goodness, this is great. Was I saw the 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 finals game for the women. Yeah, USC. Let's go. So oh, that was amazing. Really? That oh. was so impressive. And the way they were dropping threes one after another. Oh my, I was blown away. It I did. It was they won and then won the championship. Like Don Staley and crew are. They're where it's at. So you, at least you got that going for you. If you can't have New York pizza and bagels and the whole right. thing, you have basketball. Hey, I might have found a new love, and that's a good thing, you know. <laughs> so yeah. I feel like I was ignorant all this time. I didn't know about it. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you this: these kids are all millionaires now, or they're close to. So you got a whole new set of potential clients. Right. If not a fan basketball, you got to be entrepreneur, professional, managing uh, young people's money. So exactly yeah. right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, thank you for joining us to Rick Tila. Um, at some point I might be hollering at you for some SEO. We're leaning into that as we build some budget for this sure. and, and things grow, but I love that you're core value driven and you're out here for impact. So I wish you all, and I hope our paths cross again. I'm sure they will KO. Something tells me they will be well. And thank you. I appreciate being here with you. Thanks Dean. You bet. Thank you for joining Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Tune in next time and don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen.